Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and today we bring you another great in-depth interview with a CEO of a major transit system here in North America. Our interview today is with India Birdsong. She is the general manager and chief executive officer of the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. We've got a great interview for you today. She as a longtime industry veteran, uh, was at for years was at the uh, Nashville Transit System, now called WECO. And prior to that, she spent nine years with the Chicago Transit Authority. But today she brings us what she's been doing over the last less than a year when she's been GM here at the Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, the RTA. Today we talk about the COVID-19 surge and how they responded to it, how that's impacted they were doing a, uh, a bus route rerouting uh, like so many transit systems have done, and they've put that in pause now to wait and see what the impact of ridership will be afterwards and what the patterns are. And We talk about the fare collection and all kinds of other things happening at this important transit system, the story transit system for the U.S. So you're going to really enjoy this, I think. Thanks so much for being with us today on Transit Unplugged as we bring you another in-depth interview with a top CEO in America, India Birdsong. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals in North America. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and thank you for being with us today on another special edition of our worldwide phenomenon, Transit Unplugged, heard now in 99 countries around the world. And in this podcast, we interview top public transportation CEOs and executives and ask them about their lives, their careers, their current projects they're working on, about their systems, and then what the future may hold. And of course, in this environment, we're also talking to our CEOs about uh, COVID-19 and how they've managed through it and what the recovery plans are for their agencies. So this ought to be a great, interesting conversation with India Birdsong, who is the general manager and chief executive officer of the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, GCRTA India. Thank you so much for being with us today and our guest. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I'm uh, really excited to talk to you this morning. Yeah, I'm sorry we couldn't do it in person. We had planned to, uh, I planned to come to your office today in Cleveland uh, a couple months ago when we first set this up. But of course, now that travel is, is limited, et cetera, still happy to do this over the line. Thank you so much again for being with us. We like to start our shows by asking people, just tell us a little about yourself and you know how you got to where you're at today as a CEO of a, a big transit system in Cleveland, Ohio. Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Well, it's been a, an interesting ride, so to speak, to get to Cleveland. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Started my career actually in community development, which is interesting. My path is a little different. Everybody is yeah. when you start to talk to transit folks. But I actually started out as an editor and then moved over into the community development realm, working with economic development and just kind of working with different communities and facilitating different meetings. And I actually landed a job at CTA, Chicago Transit Authority, back in the early 2000s as a kind of a service planner, right? And then they were doing a bus redesign network of their system for the South Side. So long story short, I rose through the ranks, so to speak, in CTA and really learned the business of the planning side as well as the operations. And I switched over. A lot of people think that's nuts. Normally you do the opposite. Uh, but that really gave me an opportunity to cut my teeth in a large agency, Chicago. Everything changes minute to minute. So I spent almost about nine or 10 years there and worked in every shift you can imagine in, in different roles. And then I most recently worked in Nashville as chief operations officer for WeGo, as it's called now. They just rebranded about a couple of years ago. So WeGo Public Transit, formerly known as Nashville MTA, and had a great experience there. Very different from the Midwest, the the quasi-South, as I like to call it. Tennessee is definitely Southern and great people, but a very different environment when it comes to public transit. We went through a referendum as well and then got an opportunity to come to Cleveland and kind of merge that experience between the small and the large agencies. And then again, with the background in community development and advocacy, as well as just planning. And I'm here in Cleveland, so it's been a great ride. And, And when did you start the job there in Cleveland? September 2019. So I'm just about eight months in. That's great. Eight or nine. 
It's funny. I was I was telling Steve Bland that you know he must have great leadership skills to have two great female CEOs come out of Nashville, both you and Julie Tim in Richmond. And uh, I was down there a couple months ago. He said, "No, it's just that women don't want to stay around me. They, they get out as soon as they can." <laughs> He's so, great. He's he's awesome. He's, yeah, he's I love a wonderful Steve. mentor. Yeah, 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 yeah. I couldn't yeah. ask for a better person to uh, just kind of learn under. And uh, Julie Tim is great in her own right as well. Uh, we worked together hand in hand. She was the CDO, the Chief Development Officer, and me as the COO, handling operations. We always had this back and forth where we said, if she builds it and I can't run it then it's not going to work. And if I can run it and she can't build it, then it's not going to work. That's great. So yeah. we had a great time. Do you still stay in touch with her? I do. I do. We actually were in contact for the last couple of weeks talking about what are we doing in each other's respective properties. Yeah. And Steve was on the thread as well. We were talking about masks and how to get them and that kind of thing. So That's yep. great. You got your own little internal network now of CEOs. huh? You have a mini app that going on, but it's all based out of Nashville. That's cool. Um, <laughs> Hey, back to your CTA time. Who was the CEO? Do you remember back then when you were there? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So I was there for almost 10 years, and I believe we had four or five uh, CEOs during my tenure there. Wow. We had a different CEO every two years. And we started out with Frank Cruzy. He okay. was the one that started when I came in. And then we went through a couple others that came from different areas throughout the city um, and the mayor's office. And when I left, Dorval Carter actually was just coming in. Oh, okay. He literally was coming. Yeah, he was coming back the week I left. Wow. And uh, he said, where are you going? And I said, I'll go to Nashville. He said, okay, well, that's all right. I, said, well, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I love Dorval. He's been a guest on our show, too. Great guy. So, uh, man, we are in some challenging times, huh? We are. Definitely uh, not what I pictured within the first year. But, you know, I figure it'd be this way anywhere I am. So I'll just take it head on. That's right. Well, you, you start out with a big challenge like this and everything after this will be coasting, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Tell us some about the system itself, you know, kind of give us the scope, number of vehicles, drivers. That, I know the number of passengers has obviously gone down lately, but, you know, just the general, you know, kind of balls and strikes of the organization. Sure. Well, um, so the Cleveland RTA is definitely a little different from Nashville, a little larger, but definitely a little smaller than Chicago. So we've got about 2,300 employees total when you add in all of our facilities, our divisions or districts, as we call them, garages. And then you also look at our administrative offices, which are headquartered downtown with six. We've got about, you look about 350 vehicles. We do operate paratransit. We do have that in-house. And we also uh, operate paratransit with third-party operators, which is similar to what I had operated in Nashville. We also have your uh, BRT, you know, lines, you've got your trolley downtown. You've also got your big bus, as they call it, right? The 40 and 60 footers that you see kind of tooling around your, your central district and your Cleveland communities. And then you've also got your rail, which is really interesting here because I like to say that Cleveland has good bones. We've got a pretty robust park and ride system, uh, free trolley service downtown, as well as your, your rail system for light rail and heavy rail. So we've got a, a pretty good mix. We do work with union membership. So, you know, our mechanics and our operators for bus are in rail, are unionized through the Amalgamated Transit Union. So we have a pretty good relationship with the ATU. And really this COVID situation has brought us a little closer, whether we want to or not. So it's, it's really a yeah. good situation for teamwork. And then we also have a transit police operation, which is a little different than what I had worked in before. However, it's, it's a really great opportunity to be able to bring that faction in with the FLP or the Fraternal Order of Police. All in all, it's, it's a great opportunity. That is great. So when you say you have rail, you said you have a streetcar. What other types of rail do you have? So we have heavy rail and light rail. We actually so is the heavy rail like a commuter train or is it subway or what is it? It's at grade. So you're looking at the kind of the inner districts or the inner counties, and then you've got your surrounding suburbs. So it's an inner and outer ring, right? I'm always translating the language from one city to another. But yeah. you've got a, a rail system that really operates at grade through the communities and then comes into our downtown terminal at Tower City, okay. which is walkable from our, our headquarters. It's similar then probably to a commuter train service, right, where you're bringing people from the suburbs into the city? 
Right. It's similar to that. You've got a lot of state workers on those trains. You've got a lot of people that are coming in for games and that kind of thing. So if you really look at what was in Nashville, for example, and I'll just do that because that's the last thing I came from, they had the Music City Star, which is now uh, We Go Star. And it was a very small operation, but pretty robust in that it took people, the outer suburbs, right into downtown Nashville on a few trips a day. Well, this one's a little bit more robust for Cleveland, where it goes through like Shaker Heights and different areas that are coming into your downtown sure. Cleveland district. But just by virtue of route, it tends to bring people who are commuting in from work and then people who are going to Cavs games and Indians games and checking out the waterfront. So we're actually looking at, well, not rehabbing, but actually replacing the uh, vehicle on that rail system. It's a pretty costly endeavor, but it's something that we're up for the challenge and we're actually looking at uh, and interviewing different vendors to the procurement process with the goal to be able to replace that fleet within the next two to three years. Interesting. And of course, another big downtown attraction you've got is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Yes, absolutely. And it definitely brings a lot of folks here into Cleveland every day. I'm told it's a huge draw in the summer. I have not spent the summer in in Cleveland yet. came in September, so (laughs) I just missed it, but I'll make sure to uh, be involved in that this summer. So tell us some about how COVID-19 affected your system and, you know, what your plans are to try to work on recovery from that. Sure. Well, COVID-19 is something that, as you know, is affecting the entire country. And it's it's really devastating when it comes to how we've got to reimagine how we operate just as a community as, as well as as an agency. But at RTA, we really try to do different things and get creative as we go through how to combat the, the, the virus. So we started out, I believe it was May 9th, as one of the first agencies in the state to really look at the deep dive of the disinfecting of our vehicles. We've started to model our cleaning processes after the New York MTA. So we said, okay, let's just look at the biggest system possible, right, and see what they're doing and then start to adapt it to our own needs. So we actually started to bring that in and all of the bus and rail vehicles would come in overnight and get kind of a deep clean and all touchable surfaces and wipe down overnight. So we started with that and then we ramped up recently to temperature testing. We actually have that going on at the facilities, all of our facilities, and we work with a third party vendor which handles our drug and alcohol testing. So that's working out pretty well. Anybody over 104 is sent home with pay to be able to quarantine themselves or work from there. We actually are still collecting fares. We wanted to make sure that we could control the number of people that are on those buses and trains. So we have provided PPE kits to all frontline employees and actually have now provided masks to all employees, regardless of if they're in the office or out in the field. That includes your, your, your kits, I'm sorry, includes your, your mask, your gloves, your eyewear, as well as disinfecting wipes, so on and so forth. We actually have changed all of our uh, board meetings to virtual. So we're, we're playing around with the online streaming, taking questions into the email and reading them and, and kind of getting the business done while increasing the social distancing and allowing the public to participate that way. We've actually reduced our service by about 15 to 17% back in April. That was April 12th. And we have temporarily suspended our downtown trolley service as well as our parking rides. So we still are are able to pretty well meet the demand of uh, service in Cuyahoga County. However, we are increasing the social distancing or physical distancing on our vehicles. So if we're still operating at 80 to 85 percent with the reduction of the stay-at-home order, then we have a a capability to be able to have more space on that vehicle, and that's what we wanted. One other thing that I'll tell you about, or actually two, is the cloth mask. We've actually started to work with local tailors and local vendors to be able to make some of those masks as we know that the majority of the KN95 and the N95 have to go to our hospitals and our frontline workers that are dealing with the the virus itself. So that's been really helpful. We actually have had a lot of folks in our maintenance department that were upholstered and switched their job descriptions over temporarily to make masks. So it's been really helpful and we've gotten everybody what they need. And I believe yesterday, actually, we just started installing barriers or shields 
onboard our vehicles between the operator and the passenger. So now when they do, a passenger comes on, on board to pay their fare, they will have a plastic barrier between them and the operator to increase that separation, but still have the visibility. So just a few things we've been doing, but it's been working pretty well for us. Yeah, that's a, that's quite an extensive program, India. How would you how would you say it's impacted the ridership prior to COVID? You know, how many passengers about a day did you have? Do you know on an average weekday? And then what is it now? Sure, we check our our monitor our ridership every day, of course, and we're noticing anywhere between a sixty and seventy percent reduction in ridership okay. uh, every day. Yeah. So we're averaging about sixty five percent, yeah, down. By having the extra vehicles, that way you're given the capacity for people to kind of not sit right next to each other. Is that the game plan? Absolutely. You hit it right on the head. And you've got to remember that Cleveland has a pretty large terrain, right? We've got a pretty large span geographically. So a lot of our routes might have operated 20 and 30 minutes apart. We didn't want to cut those in half and then have people waiting for an hour and that kind of thing. So we we tried to keep our schedule as much as we could intact. And our game plan was really to eliminate all of the overtime and the fat, so to speak, and then make sure that we still provided the base service. That's very responsible. I mean, that, that's one of the most comprehensive plans I've heard anyone talk about so far. I'm very uh, impressed. So how has this impacted your organization financially? I mean, how are you normally funded? Do you, you have how much comes in from the fare box? Do you have sales tax, those kinds of things? And how is it impacting you? Sure. That's a really good question. We actually, it's funny, we had a a couple pillar studies that were done right around the time I got here. And one of them was an economic benefit study that was created for us. And it looked at what our impact on Cuyahoga County was. So to give you a, a quick idea, the RTA's economic impact to the county came in at about $322 million annually. Okay. Now, when you look at how much we actually get from state and local funding, the sales tax is a huge portion of what we receive. About 70 to 75% of our revenue base comes from sales tax. Passenger fares is probably somewhere between 16 and 18%, which is about 35 to $40 million. Right now, our projection is looking at a loss of about $113 million between now and the end of the year. We did get funding through the local CARES or the CARES Act, which is a relief fund, as you know, for transit during COVID. And we were set aside $111 million through the CARES Act. So if you do the math, it'll probably help float us through the end of the year, but it'll just cover the revenue and sales tax that we're projecting that we will lose. So we still have to be pretty judicious about what we do. And again, our goal is to make sure that everybody has a job at the end of the year with uh, no little to no impact as far as layoffs. And so far, we we have not laid off a single soul. Well, that's good. How have you handled paratransit? I know that uh, I've been talking to some of the contractors around the country, Laidlaw, I mean, uh, my old (laughs) employer, Laidlaw, which became First first Transit, (laughs) Transdev, those guys. Who do you have and how has it impacted their service? So paratransit is definitely a very sensitive subject, right? Because you're dealing with people one-on-one. You really have a lot of interaction right. between the operator and the passenger. Yep. And um, normally paratransit services in a typical van, you have five or six, even upwards of eight at some point, passengers on board, as well as a few, including a few wheelchairs. So we do, like I, I mentioned, we operate in-house. We have a, a great, actually a new director that came from us from another transit agency in Ohio. And he's been really instrumental in becoming the motivating factor behind the innovation that we've got in paratransit. So we've actually worked with Nick Davidson is his name that works in operations. So he came from Florida and we were working with him right before COVID to redevelop the way that we schedule trips. So we're becoming a little bit more efficient that way. And it actually has worked to our our benefit because we've been able to reduce the amount of people on board through COVID and kind of redistribute how we operate our trips to make essential trips versus discretionary trips and to also uh, be more in contact with our customers through our third-party vendor communication. We have about three or four third-party vendors that we make sure have to operate within our rules. So they're sanitizing their vans and wiping everything down and making sure that they have masks on and dealing with it that way. 
And our goal is to be able to reduce the amount of passengers on any given trip so that you reduce your exposure by way of less people on board. That's good. And have you seen a similar reduction in ridership as a result of COVID? Are you down 50 to 60% on paratransit as well? Yes, we were actually down at one point in uh, March, down 80% on paratransit. So I think paratransit took the hit first, (laughs) so to speak, ridership-wise. And that would make sense, right? Because you've got some of your most vulnerable populations on those vans. So unless people were going to dialysis or they were going to emergency grocery store trip, we really saw people kind of pulling back and scaling back on their, their, their trip. So we were able to kind of operate a little bit more efficiently and updated our, our third-party vendors. And so they were aware as well because a lot of their folks were pulling out of work just to make sure they could quarantine. Right. So let's talk about going forward now, you know, kind of the game plan for your transit agency. You had mentioned earlier that you had some plans to replace some rail cars, and I'm sure you had other plans. Why don't you tell us a little bit about those plans and are they going to be impacted at all, you think, by COVID? Are you still going to be able to push through on big capital expenditures or any other service changes you're planning to make? Sure. We are still moving forward as, as much as we can with our procurement of new rail cars. So we put a lot of work into trying to parcel out our effort over the next two to three years to be able to get the job done. So the entire budget, so to speak, that we would need in order to replace all of our rail cars is $240 million, right? So that's a pretty, pretty substantial number. Yes. And, <laughs> and we've allocated or identified about 118 so far, okay. uh, 118 million out of that. So we're still lobbying, you know, at the state level and the the federal level and the local level to be able to to get the rest of the funding in place by the time we hit that two to three year mark. However, with any project, um, you've got to plan it out, right? So we're not going to replace all of the cars tomorrow or next year. It would be a phased approach. So right now we're in the interview process to look at what the specifications look like, what vendors might be able to provide rail cars that fit our needs. And so that's where we are right now. So we're pushing ahead with that. We actually just got off a call day before yesterday with another vendor looking through what their specs are. We basically just changed the face-to-face interview process to WebEx meetings and making sure that they have their PowerPoint and kind of going at it that way. So we're still on, on track for it. Yeah. We hope that we'll be able to keep the momentum, but right now we're, we're still in place. What other big projects do you have coming up for the agency? We actually were right in the middle of a system bus network redesign study, and that was uh, went hand in hand with our strategic plan, which we also were in the middle of. We had plans. We actually were supposed to be coming out to the board with a final recommendation or and also going to the public for a second phase this summer to be be able to get final input. So we're pushed back probably about three to four months based on our projections for COVID. With with any luck, knocking on wood, we hope that COVID will be kind of settled by the fall and we can resume our surveying of our customers so that we can get input from folks on our, our final plan. But the good part about all of this is that we had not ordered bus stop signs, right? We hadn't finalized the work. So the cap wasn't completely screwed on. So now we actually can utilize the summertime to evaluate how businesses are coming back online, where the ridership has shifted, and really use this opportunity to tweak and fine tune our bus redesign. And we don't get caught with having just put in all of that work and then having to come back to the drawing board. We can do it now. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. That's really good, actually. Anything else? No, just that our our team has been really great. I'm just really proud of the work that we've done, and really our frontline employees have been amazing at coming in to to work. We have not had any attendance issues. We haven't had to cancel any runs, and which is is pretty amazing considering what they go through every day. But Cleveland has really just embraced me, and I appreciate them for that. It's a it's a tough town, but I, I tend to come from tough towns, and people are pretty passionate about public transit, so you really can't ask for much more than that. 
Very good. Well, that's great. And yeah, thank you so much for being our guest today on the show. And sounds like you've got a lot going on, but you're, ca- you're in your capable hands and a great team. I'm sure you're going to uh, continue to lead this agency through this COVID-19 crisis and out to even a better system once you get your all the results in for your, your bus reboot s- schedule and, and your new studies that are coming out of there. I'm sure that'll also probably include high frequency transit and, and other things as well, right? Yeah, that's our goal. That is it. Very good. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Transit Unplugged, powered by Trapeze Group. To stay up to date, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play, or join the conversation at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for listening.